Sadly, I'm still on the ground. I'd love to be in space. Uh, there's uh, one place that uh, Sky News currently can't afford to send me. But I am joined by Bridget. Um, she is a prototype for the rover that is currently being built in Stevenage, assembled in a clean room there by Airbus. Uh, and she, fingers crossed, will be on Mars uh, come 2020, but you can see that she's looking uh, pretty attractive there with her gold coat. Um, now, uh, you will have noticed, of course, that in the last few months we have had a Brit on the International Space Station, uh, and uh, Tim Peake has done wonders for the UK space uh, industry. He has really inspired children and also, of course, done a lot of uh, zero-gravity science too. But the sp space sector is far more than that. Uh, Rosetta, the comet-chasing spacecraft, uh, was partly built in Britain. Uh, we've got ExoMars orbiting uh, the, the red planet at the moment. Uh, and then, of course, with satellites, we are uh, punching way above our weight. In fact, through the recession, the UK space industry has still been growing at 9%. So that is a huge success story uh, there for the economy. So I'm going to be discussing uh, business, op business opportunities which are literally out of this world with an expert panel uh, in a moment. But first of all, let's take a, a quick look at some of the highlights from Tim Peake's mission. And that was the moment we should be seeing a video. <laughs> News London, how do you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. A long distance call to space. Tim Peake gives his first live TV broadcast interview. From 250 miles above South America, Britain's spaceman answered questions from an audience at the National Space Centre in Leicester and science students in the studio. How did the reality of microgravity differ from your training experiences? I can work in any orientation I like, really, and it doesn't matter whether I talk to you upside down or, uh, or the right way up. My brain just kind of flicks the picture. He told us what he's missing most. Definitely the fresh air outdoors and, and the colour green are things I'm looking forward to seeing again. And where he wants to go next. I think a moon base is a very logical step on the way to Mars. It enables us to investigate many of the challenges we're going to face in terms of radiation exposure, en energy production, um, and yet it's about the kind of safer distance, if you like, and the safer environment of the moon. And on a more serious note, he justified the millions spent on his mission. Money that's spent in space is not spent in space, it's spent back on Earth. It's jobs uh, for the economy, it's pushing the space industry to its limits. The space industry in the UK alone is one of the fastest growing, in, growing sectors. Um, so it's, it's worth it for so many different reasons. He's made videos for schools, turning the theory of physics textbooks into a floating reality. Inspiring the next generation was a key goal of his mission, and it seems to have worked. Thank you for the wonderful questions, and to everyone in London and at the National Space Centre in Leicester, goodbye. Thomas Moore, Sky News. But he had fun, didn't he? Um, so he has been a, a poster boy, a fantastic poster boy for the UK Space Agency, which of course is responsible for Britain's civil space program. Uh, and tell us more about that to set the scene uh, for uh, the discussion that will come. Uh, please welcome on stage Chief Executive Catherine Courtney. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim was sorry that he couldn't be here today, and I know I'm a poor substitute. I can't fill his uh, very big boots, but um, I would appreciate the opportunity and the invitation just to say a couple of words about the importance of space to the UK. Um, 
I think, as been mentioned, it's a thriving industry for the UK, and I think also a real case study in how successful strategic collaboration between government, industry, and the science community can really create a, a, a momentum and a thriving success story. So our space sector uh, is worth near on 12 billion pounds today. That has been uh, the growth rates for the last 10 years since the innovation growth um, strategy for space was published, has outpaced global growth in the space sector about uh, twice the rate of global growth. And we, have, we employ about 37,000 people in very high value jobs in the space sector in the UK, but actually every job in the space sector accounts for two further jobs in the wider economy. So it's been made a very big contribution. And space underpins our everyday life. We take it for granted, actually. It, it, who here used their sat-nav trying to find the right door to the hotel? <laughs> I did. Um, and you know, does anybody realize that actually part of the uh, provision of the timing signal for the London Stock Exchange that tells uh, the computers whether a stock trade was placed one second before the market closed or one second after the market closed is coming from a satellite. So we have a huge, uh, a huge reliance on space and space by definition is a market without borders. It's a global market. Space businesses and space science is an international endeavor. And that's why for us our continued membership in the European Space Agency is so important. We're able to do really groundbreaking things in collaboration with our European partners through that membership. Um, and while we are leaving the EU, we are not leaving the European Space Agency. Uh, we have the example of Bridget here today, which, uh, which I have to say, I love, um, and also we have this very week the Mars, the first phase of that mission, the Mars Trace Gas Orbiter will be starting to send back uh, its science data this week. Um, but it's not just collaboration through the European Space Agency either, it really is a global uh, endeavor. So another thing that we've had uh, this week is images from the LSAT Nano, very small satellite, but launched in partnership with the Indian Space Agency, and another success story for collaboration, international collaboration for the UK. So uh, what I wanted to just reflect on briefly is that last year the Space Agency published uh, a national space policy framework. That was a collaboration across government and across industry. And we're now in line with the work on the industrial strategy, working together with the science community, the industry, and across government uh, to work on a sector-focused growth strategy uh, that we will be looking to publish next year. And as we know, this is not just important for space, as Tim said, it's important actually for all of our industrial sectors. Because space has the power to inspire and capture the imagination of a whole generation of scientists, engineers, and technologists, and that is what we need, those STEM skills, to, to uh, bolster our future in, in a number of different industries. When I took my five-year-old to meet him, Peek was one of the perks uh, of having been appointed to this role. He came home that night saying, it was very nice to meet the astronaut mommy, but I got to meet a real live robot. And so it's not just about human spaceflight, it's about those exciting technological advances and the science. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to say is that space is changing. We have uh, new business models and new funding models. You might have seen today the coverage of the Seraphin Venture Capital Fund, uh, a new venture capital fund for space specific uh, space startups in the UK that was uh, announced and you know, very exciting new, new funding models. We had, there are lots of new space players who are self-funding very dramatic disruptive new business models. Uh, just last week, SpaceX announced that they are going to create a new internet network from space, and uh, this is why I have the piece of paper, they are going to launch 4,425 uh, new satellites in order to make that happen. Well, if you reflect on the fact that today there are only about 3,000 operational satellites up there, uh, that is a huge increase, and it's not just SpaceX who want to compete in that uh, game. And I think the question for governments, actually, is how do you enable these new disruptive business models, but also protect space as a safe operating environment? So today, there's a catalog of about 42,000 man-made pieces of debris 
uh, orbiting around at great speed in space, uh, the more congested the space environment gets, the more the, the risk profile becomes quite difficult for a licensing authority, like a regulator uh, such as ourselves, to evaluate. And obviously that's important for insurers and for financial backers of those new companies. So we want to open the UK to those new space businesses. We've already announced in the Queen's speech intention to legislate, uh, to have an enabling regulatory framework for new businesses to come and to launch satellites and, and operate space flights from the UK. But in an environment where those are more frequent and those things are going up and coming back down to Earth, which is unheard of, and a global market where, you know, in the 1950s there were two spacefaring countries. Uh, today the UN lists over 70. The big challenge for us is how do we harness that disruption to enable growth while maintaining uh, basically a safe operating environment for those businesses and for the people who rely on that infrastructure for our everyday lives. That was all I wanted to say to set the scene. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much you. indeed.